The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to the Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, as a controversial World Cup begins in Qatar, we look at the art and the museums that accompany it, plus the highs and the lows of the New York auction season and what they tell us about the art market, and the Mozambican artist, Louis Meck. I talked to Hannah McGiven, a correspondent for the art newspaper who's just been to Qatar to see the vast numbers of public art projects that will accompany the FIFA Men's World Cup that begins on Sunday, as well as the museums that the Emirate plans to open by 2030. How does this explosion of cultural initiatives sit with Qatar's record on human rights and the treatment of low-paid migrant workers in the building of its cultural venues and World Cup stadia? It's been a heady fortnight of auctions in New York. I speak to Georgina Adam, our editor at large at the art newspaper about the highs and lows and whether we can expect even more sales of blockbuster collections in the coming years. And this episode's work of the week is an untitled painting by Louis Meck, an artist born in Mozambique who came to fame as an artist in 1980s and early 1990s Zimbabwe. Tandazani Dlakama, a co-curator of the exhibition When We See Us at Zeitz Mocha in Cape Town, tells us about Meck's painting and his brief but brilliant life. Before that, a reminder about our latest subscription offer. You can save more than 50% when you buy a complete print subscription to the art newspaper with full digital access as a gift for a friend, a colleague or even as a treat for yourself. Visit theartnewspaper.com, click subscribe and enter the code XPOD22. That's XPOD22, all caps. And if you'd like to receive the January edition of the paper, make sure you subscribe before the 12th of December. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. Now, on Sunday, the Men's Soccer World Cup begins in Qatar. It's been a controversial event from the moment the Emirate was named as host in 2010. Aside from the apparent corruption among the football authorities and the rearrangement of the event to avoid the extreme heat of the Qatari summer, the biggest spotlight has fallen on ongoing human rights abuses in relation to the rights of LGBTQ people and women and the treatment of the migrant workers who've constructed the stadia for the World Cup and indeed Qatar's museums. In the run-up to the tournament, the country's authority for cultural institutions and heritage sites has announced a wave of future construction projects and revealed the first details of the museums that will house the Emirates fabled art collections. It's also unveiled the latest works in its huge public art programme. Our correspondent Hannah McGiven travelled to Qatar last month and she told me what she discovered. Hannah you've been on a visit to Qatar ahead of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you saw. So the visit was organised by Qatar Museums and they are a government organisation who look after the kind of cultural institutions, the archaeological sites, heritage sites, also kind of creative incubators of Qatar and they've been incredibly active in preparation for the World Cup. So the invitation was to kind of look at their public art sculptures which are a hugely visible part of the kind of public landscape and also to get a preview of some of the museums that they're planning in the next five to ten years. I mean, I can remember there was like a kind of massive boom of attention on Qatar about ten years ago when there mm. were lots of works being sold to Qatar at auction and all sorts of things. Obviously, the intention on the World Cup seems to have meant that the cultural offer has taken something of a backseat. But has it been sort of continuing with momentum all along, but just not in such a prominent way? So it's hard to say because there's been a lot of secrecy about the kind of art acquisitions of Qatar museums. They don't disclose any financial information. There are kind of confidentiality agreements with the market purchases. But it does seem that there was a huge kind of spending spree which took place between about 2005 and 2011. So I came across the art newspaper's coverage at that time. There was a a kind of big investigation of those purchases, linking them to Qatar. And there was a great deal of speculation about what the intent was. So it wasn't even clear whether it was the Qatari royal family buying for a private collection for themselves or whether they were intending to build a museum for this kind of Western, modern and contemporary art because they already had two art museums which were dedicated to the region. So the Museum of Islamic Art has been around since 2008 
and then the Mattaf Museum of Arab Modern Art opened two years after that. So the acquisitions were happening around the same time, but it really wasn't clear what the destination was. And now that has been revealed um, that they are building a kind of global art museum, which will open in 2030. So another part of the trip was to see the new exhibitions that they've opened just in time for the World Cup. They are expecting a huge influx of tourists into the country. I think 1.5 million was the estimate. And bearing in mind that the population is just under 3 million, that's kind of a huge boost for visitorship. So it's not clear how many of the football fans will be going to museums, but Qatar museums have certainly put on a show for them. If you are one of the visitors going to the World Cup, the kind of highest profile thing you're going to see is an extraordinary number of public sculptures around Qatar. Is that right? Yes. I mean, they're very visible even from when you arrive in the airport. I'm not sure exactly how many there are in the airport, but I think at least 10. There's 100 installed by Qatar Museums currently, of which around 40 are new installations for the World Cup. And they are extremely eye-catching, for the most part, colourful works of art by very high-profile international artists, some of them. So they're kind of signature styles of, of those artists. That's right. I mean, for instance, there's a massive Jeff Koons, is that right? Yes, it's an inflatable sculpture and it's incredibly shiny and it's in the form of a dugong, which is a marine mammal that is native to the Gulf. And the purpose is partly environmental to raise awareness of the kind of vulnerability of dugongs and that species and the kind of conservation efforts that are happening in Qatar now. Obviously, there are other artists, as you say, who are very prominent. There's somebody like Olafur Elias and, and you mentioned the sort of an environmental related subject there. Olafur is, is an artist who has been at the front of art's response to climate change, for instance. Is there any sense in which artists are in any way grappling with the fact that Qatar is a fossil fuel economy, that it has such a prominent role in a major issue right now? Are you getting any sense that the artists are commenting on this in relation to what they're doing? Well, Olafur Eliasson has been the most outspoken about that issue, as you would expect from his past work on the subject. And it seems like his motivation for doing the commission with Qatar Museums, which has resulted in this very large sculptural installation in the desert to the north of the country, and that just opened a few weeks ago before the World Cup. He made comments about how his dialogue with Qatar Museums has really facilitated discussions around climate action in the country. And he's made the point that Qatar is a really critical place for climate action to take place. They're a desert nation. Obviously, we know that summer temperatures for the workers building the stadium for the World Cup have been incredibly high. And there's been a great deal of concern about that. So his point is really that engagement is a form of dialogue and that that will ultimately contribute to, to climate action, which is a global issue and that we should all be contributing to that. You mentioned about the, the workers there, the workers' rights, the human rights of workers has been the massive focus ahead of this, as well as LGBTQ issues. In terms of the installation of the sculptures, has there been any focus on that? Because obviously, you know, building major works of art in public space takes a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of people. Has there been any focus on that at all in terms of the discussions? So again, Oliver Eliasson is the only artist I came across who has spoken about the issue. So during the kind of press unveiling of Qatar Museum's art programme before the World Cup, there were a number of public discussions. And Oliver Eliasson and the chairperson of Qatar Museums, who is Sheikha al Mayasa Al Tani, she is a, a member of the royal family of Qatar. She is the sister of the current ruler of Qatar, the daughter of the former ruler. So the moderator for the discussion did raise the issue of the cost of building in the desert. And the words human rights weren't used, migrant workers, that, that wasn't mentioned. There was an implication. But the discussion that then followed was mostly focused on climate, actually. And the Shaker's comment was that every form of construction in any country will have a cost, and that's not unique to the desert. But Oliver did address some of the concern. As I mentioned, he talked about his kind of dialogue that he's had behind the scenes with the Qatari government. He also released a statement on his studio website, which mentioned human rights. So he said... 
I am a strong believer in upholding human rights, as outlined by the UN. Entering into a work collaboration in Qatar, I'm careful as an outsider and as a European to evaluate how I can best support these values. Throughout the installation of Shadows Travelling on the Sea of the Day, that's the title of the work in the desert, my team was dedicated to ensuring that all human rights standards were upheld on the building site. This must ultimately become the standard throughout the country. So Oliver did release that statement and addressed the issue through it, but as far as I'm aware, none of the other artists involved in Qatar Museum's projects have commented on the issue. I know you've spoken to curators and art people who've actually worked in Qatar about this issue and about other issues. What sense did you get from them of the kind of conditions under which they work and to what extent they are sort of baked into their kind of approach to curating or organising shows, even like sort of before they get there, as it were? So I did speak with a researcher who has conducted interviews with Qatar Museum's curatorial staff, which were anonymized. So she published a research paper drawing kind of wider conclusions about the curatorial approach, the reception to contemporary art in Qatar, Western contemporary art, which she describes as alien to Qatar. And there were a number of controversies back in 2013 when some Qatar Museum's works were removed from display after criticism from Qatari social media users. So for instance, the Adel Adesamed work is the most famous one, which you wouldn't think was a terribly controversial image. It's almost a joke. It's Zinedine Zidane. Very appropriately for the World Cup, it's Zinedine Zidane headbutting his Matarazzi, the Italian yes. footballer in the World Cup final. But that was seen as idolatrous. Is that right? Yes. So that was part of the commentary from, I believe it was a Qatari journalist and then other social media users joined a campaign against that work and saying that it promoted violence and that it was a form of idolatry. And that work was quite promptly removed. I don't believe it's been put back on display ever since then. There was an announcement earlier this year that it would be reinstalled for the World Cup. But from what I gather, that hasn't occurred. So perhaps they're waiting for the moment to pass and then to install it more quietly. But actually, her comments to me, which I quoted in the article, were separate from the study, but they were based off my reading of okay, it. That, well, yeah, go, go ahead and um, listen. So in that study, looking at the kind of reaction to the Abdesamed work and the decision to withdraw the works, the researcher, whose name is Serena uh, Yervolino, found that it was a form of state self-censorship at play, that the decision to remove the works was to shut down any potential critique that could be directed at the ruling family and therefore to kind of preserve the social order, the political order in Qatar. And in that sense, it was a political decision, but it was unusual because normally there's an unspoken understanding that the works chosen by Qatar Museums as a government organisation will not be offensive to local cultural sensibilities. They omit the most controversial works of art by the artists that they're choosing to show there. So there's a kind of process of omission that occurs before an exhibition is even organised. So the kind of case of censorship in that instance was, was actually very unusual and rare. That's really interesting. And then so therefore... When a major foreign curator who is brought in to do a show, which happens a fair amount in Qatar, right? When that happens, would you say they are in a way self-censoring before they get there? My understanding is that there are guidelines provided by Qatar Museums as an organisation to their guest curators about the kinds of work to avoid when you're making a selection for a show. So I spoke with Massimiliano Gioni, who's the artistic director of the New Museum, very respected curator internationally, and he has curated Takashi Murakami and Jeff Koons exhibitions in Qatar. He's currently curated the Valentino fashion exhibition that's on display for the World Cup. And he said that he was asked to avoid any works that featured nudity and works that included representations of certain religious figures. So he made it clear that there were curatorial parameters within which exhibitions in Qatar occur, but he said that he believes firmly in participation and dialogue 
with what is a kind of growing cultural community. And he spoke about the value of, of that community for uh, local creativity in the region and creating a kind of support network for those artists locally. I mean, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because, of course, one of the terms that will be consistently used, it's being used in terms of the World Cup, this term sports washing, and many would regard the public sculpture programme as a form of art washing and effectively you know, hiding the human rights issue, which has been heavily criticised by organisations like Amnesty International and so on, behind this glossy and, and spectacular, frankly, display of sculpture. And what Gioni is saying is that it's not quite as simple as that, effectively. Yeah, I mean, I think for the international art world figures who are collaborating with Qatar museums, they regard it as a form of dialogue and cultural exchange. And cultural exchange is a message that has been really emphasised by Sheikha al Mayasa as the chair of Qatar Museums. It's a diplomatic... Um, it's soft power. Yes, it's, it's explicitly a soft power exercise in the sense that it is about Qatar positioning itself in the world and saying to the world how open they are, how supportive they are of culture and the arts. So within that kind of overall diplomatic mission of the cultural program, there's obviously room for fostering creativity, putting in place education programs, introducing local audiences to art that they've never seen before in their home country, in their home region. And and so the people I spoke to were defending the kind of positive impacts of that ambition. And of course, beyond the World Cup, you've mentioned this museum's expansion that's going on. Can you tell us more about the new museums that will arrive and when they'll arrive? Yeah, so during the World Cup, currently, there are two exhibitions which are designed to be teasers, curtain raisers for future museums being built in Doha. And one of them is the Lucille Museum. So this is a rebranded museum from what was previously known as the Orientalist Museum. And it's formed around a collection of Orientalist art, 19th century paintings by mostly European artists of a kind of imagined Orient and East. And I think that's a very interesting starting point for a museum in the Gulf. It's sort of counterintuitive. You expect these collections in Europe where they've been heavily criticised. One thinks of Edward Said's critical theory are all around Orientalism. But yes, in the Gulf, that would seem a counterintuitive kind of museum. Yes, um, but it's clear that the intent with the museum is to really deconstruct the narrative around Orientalism and bring it into a kind of comparison visually with material from local makers and artists and also to address the kind of question of cultural exchange again between east and west as something that has occurred for centuries in the middle east and really situating the middle east at the center of that exchange simply by its geographical location right and and herzog and de Meuron have been appointed as the architects do we know what their building's going to look like yet Yes, there were architectural models at the centre of the exhibition. And so the plan is to have a circular building, which in kind of various different ways pays tribute to Islamic architecture and forms. So the circular building is bisected by this crescent line that separates the front of house galleries from the back offices. And then there will be four what they're calling anchor rooms, and they are a kind of replica or homage to traditional Islamic architecture in different regions of the world. And that speaks to this idea that the Shaker has talked about a lot, which is this local global dialogue all the time. You talked about cultural exchange. The local global thing is is right at the heart of the kind of whole ethos of the cultural approach in Qatar, right? Yes, certainly for the Lucille Museum, it seems to be the central concept now driving forward that museum um, and that rebranding exercise. And that museum is planned to open in 2029. And then we could talk about the Art Mill Mm -hmm. Museum, which is planned to open the following year, 2030. It sounds bonkers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So another exhibition is titled Art Mill 2030, and that is 
a kind of preview for this global art museum that is being built. And it's an incredibly prominent building. It's a former, well, a still operational, actually, flour mill right beside the water at Doha Bay. And it has these towering silos that are going to be a key part of the the future galleries. And in fact, the architects, the Chilean firm Elemental that is run by Alejandro Aravina, they are building more silos. So there'll be a kind of forest of silos. And he's talked about that also being an environmental and sustainable decision because the form of them lowers the temperature by several degrees. And part of the concept for the architecture is to avoid anything that will raise the temperature. There's not going to be glass surfaces everywhere in this museum. It's designed to reduce the environmental footprint of the museum. And in terms of what will be in the art mill, it's an enormously diverse range of things, right? I mean, it really super diverse. It's not even just broadly international art. It goes way beyond art objects, right? Yes, this is a very interesting part of the curatorial concept, which is being developed by Catherine Grenier, who is the French art historian who was formerly deputy director of the Centre Pompidou. Um, she is currently the director of the Giacometti Foundation in Paris. And she said that one of the ways in which this is going to be a 21st century museum and change the museum model from what we know of, you know, 19th and 20th century European museums is that it will be multidisciplinary and radically so. So there will be painting and sculpture and all the kind of visual art forms that you would expect, but also music, literature, cinema, film props, design and architecture, and even cars, because one of the other future museums that Qatar is is planning is a car museum. And so there is a collection of historic vehicles. And so they could draw on that for the displays at the art mill too. And what she said is that it will be as if there are many different museums under one roof and that there won't be divisions between the sections. So it's clear that this will be a very interdisciplinary museum. It's impossible to know at this stage what that will look like because the exhibition that they have at the moment is really focused around the building and they've commissioned six contemporary artists to respond to the flour mill, to spend time with the workers, to document the building as it exists now before it will close and be converted into a museum. So that display doesn't address the kinds of future curatorial displays that we'll be seeing from the art mill. But Certainly the kind of hints of it are very interesting and also I think raise challenges for the curatorial team to bring coherence to such diverse displays. Certainly sounds like it. Um, You mentioned Catherine Gournier there. The interesting thing I think about that is that like the Lucille Museum, there is a Western museum head. So that's a curious thing. Again, that seems counterintuitive if you're talking about changing the model to bring in almost a kind of what feels to me almost like a colonial approach to the way that the actual museums are being directed and curated. Yes, I think it's been a natural consequence of such a fast acceleration of the art scene in Qatar and the fact that they want to build these museums and complete them by 2030 means that they don't yet have a kind of generation of museum professionals in place in the country to deliver those projects. And they are bringing in high profile curators, former museum directors, who've really established themselves in Western museums to lead on those projects. I understand that there's a growing number of of staff working with them who are Qatari or from the region, but it seems that the leadership is coming from Western museum professionals. I think it is something that they want to change because I had a conversation with the the project lead who is British, who is working on the Lucille Museum. And she said that part of the preparations for opening for 2029 will be uh, putting in place a team of specialists in the region who really are focused and have been focused on the issue of East-West exchange, but from the perspective of the global south. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you.
Hannah's report on Qatar's museums and cultural initiatives will be in the December print edition of the Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for Android or iOS, which you can download from Google Play or the App Store. Coming up, we hear about the New York auctions and the Mozambican artist Louise Meck. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. The wave of activist attacks on artworks in museums shows no sign of relenting. This week, climate emergency protesters stop fracking around, poured maple syrup on the Canadian painter Emily Carr's work, Stumps and Sky, at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And two members of Let's Degeneration, the group that last month threw mashed potato at a Monet Haystacks painting in Germany, poured oil over Gustav Klimt's death and life at the Leopold Museum in Vienna. Meanwhile, the International Council of Museums, or ICOM, has stated that it shares the concern concerns recently expressed by museums regarding the safety of collections and the concerns of climate activists as we face an environmental catastrophe that threatens life on Earth. The organisation's statement added that it would like museums to be seen as allies in facing the common threat of climate change. It's now five years since the $450 million sale of Salvatore Mundi as a Leonardo painting at Christie's in New York. And among a host of features on our website are reflections on the recent conference in Leipzig in Germany, organised by the Leonardo scholar Frank Zellner, devoted to exploring the many questions surrounding the Salvatore Mundi project, including the status of the controversial version that was bought by Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, at the infamous auction. Another report looks at what protections, if any, the five year warranty that came with the painting, which is now expired, offered the buyer in the first place. And finally, the British street artist Banksy has confirmed that he's created seven murals in various locations in Ukraine, including the capital Kiev. Speculation has been mounting that the anonymous artist was in the war-torn country after three works were spotted last week. One mural depicts a man said to resemble the Russian president Vladimir Putin being thrown to the floor during a judo match with a young boy. Putin holds a black belt in the sport. Another, painted within the ruins of a bomb building, features a gymnast doing a handstand. You can read all these stories and more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This November, Christie's Milan presents two online auctions, bringing you the best of post-war and contemporary art that's curated with an all-Italian taste. Bidding for both the 20th, 21st century Milan sale and the dedicated auction of the Agrati collection will open on the 23rd of November. Don't miss important examples by Yayoi Kusama, Chantal Joffe and Carol Rama alongside a group of works by artists from indigenous communities in Australia. Viewing at Palazzo Clerici in Milan opens on the 24th of November through to the 29th of November. If you're in London before the 9th of December, why not catch the final weeks of Christie's selling exhibition, Macabre, in their headquarters at 8 King Street in St James's. Co-curated with the contemporary artist Benjamin Spires, the exhibition looks at the artistic treatment of the macabre through the ages, from the grim and eerily strange to the distorted and fascinatingly dark. Wherever you are in the world, all Christie's exhibitions have free entry and are open to all. Discover all this and more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, it's auction fortnight in New York, and there have been some extraordinary sales, as well as some rather tepid ones in that time. I caught up with Georgina Adam, our editor-at-large, to look at the results and ponder what they tell us about the market now and into the future. Georgina, let's begin with some headline figures. The big sale of last week was the Paul Allen sale, the former Microsoft guy who was uh, an extraordinary collector for many years. What were the headline figures from that sale? Well, I mean, they pulverised estimates. I'm going to talk in figures with fees. And the sale at Christie's made $1.5 billion, which is an all-out record. Not only did it make $1.5 billion, five lots made over $100 $100 million, which is extraordinary. And another 15 lots made over $20 million. So, I mean, it was extraordinary. It was really huge. I would contest the idea that this was a collection. I think it was more an accumulation of ultra blue chip works. He'd obviously bought with really infinitely deep pockets. And they were very, very good. To say it was a collection is not quite the same because there wasn't really a focus on it, even though Christie's did say, well, he liked landscape. But actually, 
it was really more an accumulation of really top notch works of art. That's right, because there's things like Jasper Johns in there, which don't fit that sort of landscape narrative. And even like the Lucian Freud, it's an absolutely stellar Lucian Freud. But you'd never say that that had much in common with E.G. Hockney, who's of the same sort of generation, but a completely different kind of art, if you like. Absolutely. I mean, the Hockney, it went from Hockney to Botticelli. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, when they were shown in London, those two works were hung next to each other, which was quite jarring in a way. But uh, you can't contest the quality. I mean, the quality was amazing. The Sora was absolutely amazing. The Gauguin was fantastic. Uh, there was an amazing Van Gogh. All of those works made over a hundred million. The Sura, which, which which is of course the, the diminutive version of the poseurs, the, the the models, which is that extraordinary Sura, which is in the Barnes collection in Philadelphia. It struck me that that must be close to the highest amount of money per square inch in the history of auctions, of course, other than <laughs> Salvatore Mundi by, by Leonardo. <laughs> yes, I have to say I hadn't worked that out because it's true. It's not a very big picture, but it is absolutely a wonderful picture. I and mean, you could see there was a buzz about that collection right from before the auction because it showed in London, it's been showing in, a, in different parts of the world. And, and I noticed when I went to see it that there were lots of members of the public looking at it. You know, they were clearly intrigued to see, for instance, the great Cézanne Mont-Saint, Mont-Saint-Victoire and the Chira and all the others. It, it felt like there was a bit of buzz about the collection just generally as a collection of works of art. Uh, yes, I believe 20,000 people went to see it. And yes, there's always this feeling that these really great works of art might disappear again after the auction. So if you want to see them, seeing them in the pre-sale view is, is a good idea. So when it comes to Sotheby's this week, then, of course, that said an extraordinary benchmark at Christie's last week. Did Sotheby's have anything that was of a comparable nature in terms of either the the sort of uh, fame of the collector or the kind of quality of the collecting, or was it a was it much more of a sort of piecemeal kind of series of sales? Well, Sotheby's had in fact four sales. I think the best was the Solinger collection, which was what they call a white glove sale, i.e., everything was sold. Although, to an extent, these white glove sales are slightly manipulated in the sense that they withdraw anything that they're not absolutely sure. Of selling, and I think one work was withdrawn from that sale. But yes, they made $137.9 million on that sale. And that was, in a sense, more, I think, of a collection. He had been president of the Whitney Museum. And once again, I think always when there's been a collector, a, a famous name, that does make a difference. It enhances the attractiveness of a sale. And this was also the case with Solinger, as I say. It was uh, White Glove. And there were, interestingly, there were no guarantees, whereas the Paul Allen sale was completely guaranteed. And in fact, quite interestingly, although it did terribly well, the Solinger collection, and did better than pre-sale estimates, there was one work, a Picasso, that sold quite a little bit underestimate. But I don't think we should read too much into that. Right. But it's interesting that, isn't it? Because Sonja was clearly, when you look at those works in comparison to the Allen sale, which, as you say, is more just high quality works from across different periods and so on. The Sonja sale is a connoisseur's sale, effectively, isn't it? Absolutely. And I mean, it's normal in a way. I mean, he was at the Whitney, whereas Paul Allen was busy with Microsoft. So it is completely different. Absolutely. The Sonja sale was, was auctioned on the same evening as the modern art sale, which had you know, individual items, including, for instance, a Mondrian. What's interesting about that is that, you know, the Mondrian was guaranteed and it broke a record, but it seems like there was no buzz at all around that work. It was a single bid. It sold for basically what it was expected to sell for. And even though it was an absolutely stellar Mondrian from that classic Mondrian period, it didn't seem to create any kind of real excitement. In fact, the whole sale, apparently, now I wasn't present at the sale, but obviously I've read the reports. It Mm. seems that the whole sale was quite a little bit lacklustre. And that wasn't only the case. I mean, these are various owners' sales, Mm. and they're very different from these stellar collections with a name attached to them. And some things did well, some things didn't do as well. The Mondrian did do well. It was, of course, guaranteed. And according to the bare facts, it was guaranteed by Pierre Chen, who is a Taiwanese businessman who is big into guarantees and apparently also guaranteed Salvador Mundi, although we've never really had confirmation of that. In fact, uh, guarantees were very present over the whole sale season. I mean, it has to be said that this sale season was the richest sale season ever held. 
But that was to a large extent, of course, thanks to these great collections, and particularly the Paul, Paul Allen sale. The other sales did okay. You could not say they didn't do well, but we didn't see soaring figures the way we did with Paul Allen. Interesting. I think the work that sort of most confirms that to me is the Andy Warhol car crash, which sold on Wednesday evening at Sotheby's. And to me, that looks like about as stellar a Warhol as you can get. It's from the Death and Disaster series. It's, a, you know, it's one of those classic car crash. It's massive. It's got a great provenance. It went through the Aman family, who are deeply connected to Warhol over the years. And it's, it just shows how warped my idea of money has become since being involved in the art world, that it sold for 85 million with fees. And I'm like is that it <laughs> yes so it just felt in a way that felt again two bids by the sounds of it no great bidding war whereas I thought that might have been the kind of work which did generate that kind of attention yes it made just about what the pre-sale estimate was uh, there is a there was a rumor again from uh, Josh Bear that it was bought by Patrick Drahi who owns Sotheby's there's no confirmation of that but it was bought by a staffer who does buy for him yes I mean, I think what you've seen, apart obviously from Solinger, Paul Allen, is what we've seen is that the very top end of the market, these works by very, very blue chip artists like Warhol are not flying in the same way that works by very much younger, I wouldn't quite say emerging, but younger artists. They're not flying in the same way. And it was very interesting to look at the now sale which saw extraordinary, sometimes 10 times estimate on some of the works, but it's not at that level. I mean, there is less oxygen at the top of the market and you're not going to see something double in estimate when it's already put at tens of millions. It's interesting noting some of the comments from people at the top of the auction houses who are saying things like there's a huge supply at the moment we've come to the end of a period where we've had fair after fair and then auction after auction and so the fact that we've had sort of decent results is actually a pretty good indicator that, of the health of the art market. I think we're at absolutely at a hinge period as far as the market is concerned because we are seeing what is going to be the greatest wealth transfer ever, I think, in history, because we've seen the baby boomers who are now in their 60s, 70s, and they are gradually going to disappear. But they're going to pass on to their children and their grandchildren colossal amounts of money. So the estimates vary. I mean, I've seen 35 trillion, I've seen 70 trillion. I think nobody really knows. And part of that will be art. And I think that there has been a report that there are another 20 to 25 collections like the Paul Allen collection, let's put it that way, that are going to come to market over the next 5, 10, 15 years. I do wonder whether the market can absorb all of that because the buyers are younger and not necessarily quite as enamoured of the taste of their parents or grandparents. So we shall see. At the moment, there's no doubt that these works of art, there is a ready market for them. They're blue chip. They're, in the case, for example, of the Seurat, it was a one opportunity to buy it. You're not going to be able to buy something like that again. Whether that will continue down the line, and I think what is very significant is the Asian collectors who have been very strong in the market. I'm not sure that all of the works collected by this generation of baby boomers will have the same attraction to Asian collectors. They are focused, they do love Basquiat, and I think Basquiat will endure. They love Nara, but some of the other, like Christopher Wool, I'm not sure that they are going to be so interested. We shall see. That's really interesting. I noticed that some of the stats around, for instance, the Paul Allen sale, I noticed that it was like 12% sold to Asian collectors, they said. But for instance, the Sotheby's sale last night, it was about 50% to Asian collectors. And obviously that had a lot more contemporary art in it and so on. I guess there's that focus then on the sort of post-war contemporary and ultra contemporary that seems to be much more within the kind of taste of Asian collectors. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. It was 50%, as you say, the now sale, 50% went to Asia. And that, that's a really interesting statistic because they have different tastes. They have different cultural values and the, of iconography. And we shall see if they're going to be prepared to mop up all of these sales that are going to come to auction. 
Right. So it's really interesting, isn't it? Because there's this perception that, okay, on the one hand, as we said in this discussion, it seems like bodies of art collected by notable collectors are the way to go in terms of like maximizing sales. But to a certain extent, if there are so many of those that might come onto the market, then you risk oversupply, do you? Or would the auction houses be concerned about that? I don't know if they are concerned. I don't think they would certainly not say they were concerned. But I do think that there could be a danger of too much arriving on the market at the same time. I think probably the auction houses themselves will also try to regulate that flow as well, perhaps by selling privately some works, because, of course, that's a very big business for them. So I think they'll send to auction the ones that they think they can definitely sell where they're sure to get guarantees, because guarantees has been a big, big story in New York this week. It really has. And then others, they will perhaps advise the vendors to uh, perhaps hold off, to put into two sections, something like that. I mean, the Paul Allen sale was in two sections, and I believe there's more to come. So guarantees, effectively, we talked about guarantees before, but effectively, you would say that it sort of suggests that there is a caution in the art market, at least a caution, if not worries. (laughs) Interestingly, there was a last minute guarantee for the Warhol, for the very, very big car crash Warhol. And it was a third party. It was an irrevocable bid, in fact. So I think there is a little bit of caution on the part of the auction houses. And of course, they do want to be able to broadcast that they've made incredible sales. And of course, the guarantees allow them to say that. The general public doesn't necessarily realise that a lot of these sales are actually pre-sold. One of the interesting things, of course, again, is that we've been talking about these extraordinary astronomical figures. We were wondering to what extent there was going to be an effect to the cost of living crisis, soaring inflation and so on. One of the sort of reading between the lines elements of all of this is that even while, obviously, as you say, extraordinary massive numbers over the past couple of weeks, there's just little hints that there is a bit of a downturn in the sense that, for instance, I noticed that one of the auction house people said that there were fewer bids in the actual room for the contemporary works. There was a bit less buzz, a few fewer collectors bidding, just a bit less kind of energy in the room in relation to the contemporary market, for instance. So do you think that's a sort of an accurate reflection that, again, there's a, there's a certain amount of collectors who maybe have stepped back a bit given the economic situation we're in? I did see a comment that the froth has gone off the market, uh, which would bear that out. But on the other hand, the very, very wealthy remain extremely wealthy. They are not touched by rising electricity bills, for example. The luxury goods companies are doing quite well. So I don't think that the cost of living crisis is affecting people who are spending a hundred million on an extraordinary work of art. On the other hand, We are in very turbulent times. There is probably going to be a recession in Europe. In fact, I believe there's already a recession here. I don't think this will really affect the very top of the market, but I think it has, to an extent, as that commentator said, taken some of the froth off the market. People are probably going to be a little bit more careful. On the other hand, rising inflation is positive for the art market because it's a tangible asset, somewhere to park some money when money itself is being devalued by inflation. Georgina, as ever, thank you so much for telling us about this extraordinary market we're in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You can read all our auction reports on the website and the app. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. This Sunday, the 20th of November, the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art Africa, or Zeitz Mocha, opens When We See Us, a century of black figuration in painting. It features 200 works of art by artists from across the African continent and its diaspora, lent by more than 70 institutional and private collections in 26 countries. Among the artists is the Mozambique-born painter Louise Meck, and I spoke to the exhibition's co-curator, Tandazani Lakama, about an untitled painting by Mech, made in 1992. Tandazani, before we talk about the work of the week, let's talk about the artist, because I've, I'm sure lots of our listeners won't know anything about Louis Mech. So tell us about him. So Louis Mech is 
or was a prolific artist from Mozambique who was born in Tete province in 1966. However, he grew up in Beira and Chimoyo. As the civil war in Mozambique went on, he was conscripted to serve in the army. However, he fled and sought refuge in Zimbabwe, where his art career started. And tell me about his art career then in Zimbabwe, because, I mean, he died very young, but he must have achieved a lot because we're talking about not much more than a decade of art making, right? So he died in 1998 at a very young age. When he moved to Zimbabwe or fled from Mozambique into Zimbabwe, he wound up living in a very big high density area called Mufakosi. And soon after, he enrolled in the BAT workshop school which is now called the National Gallery School of Visual Art and Design. However, he was kicked out for misdemeanor. Thankfully, he ended up meeting uh, another prolific painter, Helen Leros, who was like a mother figure to him and so many other artists. And through that, he gained mentorship. He had access to art supplies and became part of a budding group of very important artists of that generation. And can you say something about the style that he paints with? Because the image that we're going to talk about here, this untitled painting from 1992, it's very expressive, it's very gestural, there's a, there's a broad array of colour and so on. Yes, yeah, so one thing I love about Lewis Make is that he was able to say so much with so little. So in terms of style, he slapped his paint on very thick, he refused to smooth out his brush marks, so they're very visible. He outlined his figures in thin, dark hues, foregrounding them with gestural layers of vibrant color and was extremely frugal with detail. He loved to paint quotidian scenes. So he painted a lot of daily life, probably some of the things that you'd see in Mufakosi or other high density areas or other parts of Harare as they went up upon his daily business. Right. And what are we looking at here? Because we know we're looking at figures, but we can't be clear exactly what we're doing, can we? Yes. And that's what I loved about his work. A lot of his works were ambiguous so that you can kind of come up with your own narrative in the works, but still get a sense of uh, the movement and, and some of the essence of what he was trying to say. So in this work, you're looking at two men sitting down. Um, they might be sitting down on a stoop or on a box, probably one of the high density areas that Lewis Make would um, spend a lot of time. And it could be men um, having a drink after work or during lunchtime or playing a game. But it's people coming together to gather and to catch up and to, to just be. And it's capturing something that still is quite a common scene in some places in Harare. And do you think he would have made sketches on the spot or would he have just sort of remembered this scene and recreated it in his studio in paint? I suspect that he would have probably painted from memory. He probably would have had sketches, but I don't think he would have had uh, people sort of um, sitting for him. The gesture and his style and the, the just the sheer number of work suggests that he probably painted from his memory and exaggerated certain things and just was constantly documenting daily life. Why do you think it was so important to him to document daily life in the way he did? Because it really is, you know, if you look at the broader array of his work, it's very detailed scenes of very particular kind of daily life. And he's really sort of seeming to zone in on these things and, and want to memorialize them somehow. Very recently, I came across an interesting quote by Lewis Mick, where he said, I am black. I think black. I paint black. And I think that sort of encapsulates or epitomizes or underpins this practice. He was interested in painting people who looked like him, part of his community, in a way that was not stereotypical or was not geared towards the tourist market. He was really interested in painting what he saw. And there's something powerful about painting the quotidian or painting black bodies um, devoid of struggle or devoid of trauma. 
And you mentioned that he was sort of part of a group of artists at that time. Were they all taking that similar sort of documentary approach? Was it very much a concern of all of them to somehow reflect their everyday life and actually give visibility to that life, if you like? Yes, yeah, so Lewis Mick, some of his contemporaries were artists like Richard Witikani and uh, later on Charles Kamangwana, and all of them painted scenes of daily life. And I'm curious to know whether they were responding to the time in that they were painting in the 80s and 90s. Zimbabwe had just gained independence and they had new freedom or different um, outlooks and perspectives and were projecting themselves into the future, but also documenting their daily lives. So there is something quite special about the other group of artists or generation that Lewis May came out of. And tell me, how well received, how broadly received, how much criticism did he gain in his lifetime? Had he become a notable figure? By the time he died, um, he had become a very notable figure. There's a writer named Plot Marco who basically says that he, he changed or influenced an entire generation of artists. This writer says that uh, Mick's successful promotion was the catalyst for the beginning of an African contemporary painting movement around Gallery Delta in the late 1980s. And I would agree with that. I know artists today, you know, several generations later, who still reference make. And he's sort of an artist who's spoken about fondly. He was quite rebellious. He refused to be pigeonholed. He refused to kind of bow to some of the demands of like white patronage in Zimbabwe. And since since he's died, there's been several retrospectives of his work in Zimbabwe and other parts of Southern Africa. And of course, there's this tragedy that he died so young. He was not even 32 by the time he died. And he died of an AIDS-related illness, I believe. Yes. So when Lewis Mick died, he was just over 30 and he died from HIV AIDS. He was part of a generation of artists who lost their lives to that pandemic. But his work still lives on through citations and references um, by other artists from that region, from Zimbabwe. Can you say something about how Lewis and, and that scene fits in with your show? Because it sounds an extraordinary show in the sense that you've got 200 artworks, I believe, and looking at different territories, different cities who've been so important in capturing the black experience in all sorts of different ways across the African diaspora. Yes, yeah, so Lewis Make is one of almost 200 artists in the When We See Us, A Century of Black Figuration exhibition at Zeitzmacher. And the artists that we've selected, like Lewis Make, we hope that they evoke or remind us of important narratives of the fact that the painting we see today is part of a historical continuum. When you look at an artist like Lewis Make, you're reminded of important schools that might not be so well known outside of their context, like the BAT Workshop School, or important spaces like Gallery Delta. You're also reminded of the connections that might not be so obvious. So there's similar artists who were working in different regions at that time. Um, Louis Make in 1991 was part of the Pachipamwe Art Workshop, which was quite significant because later on, artists like Chris Ophili would attend. So... In looking at one painting like this painting, Untitled, that was created in 1992, you're reminded of important workshops, important moments, important schools, important collectives. And when you look at them as a big conglomeration of artists or a big exhibition, you start to see all these parallels and connections that may not be so obvious. And it seems to me that the statement that you read out by Louis Meck earlier on, this idea of being black, seeing black and painting black. It's almost like an emblem for the show, a kind of a kind of manifesto for the show. Is that right? Yes. Um, when We See Us is about how black artists have represented themselves. It's about black subjectivity, black consciousness, black joy. It's about black people expressing themselves and how they've always expressed themselves in the last hundred years. Um, without being stereotyped or without centralizing trauma. 
And so artists like Lewis make remind us that artists have always been painting, you know, themes of repose in the everyday and daily life. So that's one reason that Lewis make is so significant. Well, Tantazani, thank you so much for telling us about this amazing artist. Thank you. When We See Us, a century of black figuration in painting is at Zeitzmoker in Cape Town, South Africa, from the 20th of November until the 3rd of September 2023. And that's all for this week. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Hannah, Georgina and Tan Dazani. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.